Large trade in supplies promoters sell 2.5% equity through a block deal window. The stock higher by 4%. Bharti Airtel surges on the back of its Q4 results. The India mobile business meets estimates. Subscriber edition also strong at 6 million users. Jefferies issues a buy call on the stock with a price target of 1590. It's not the only Bharti stock that we're watching this morning. Bharti Hexacom, after listing, reports its first results. The quarter came in steady. Brokerage firm Jefferies issues a buy call on the stock also raises the start target price. Siemens slips but recovers from the lows of the day despite a strong showing in Q4 after the board approves the demerger of its energy arm and plans to list it as a separate entity. Weimart Retail climbs on the back of its earnings. The company reported revenue growth that was in line with uh, the street. The management tells CNBC TV18 they've seen signs of consumption pick up and they guide for 13-15% to 15 revenue growth led by 6-7% to 7 same store sales growth in FY25. Hello and welcome to Chartbusters. I am Hormus Patakia with me is Mangalam Malu. We started off the day pretty well but we are off the highs of the day now. The Nifty is now at 22,150. After a three-day recovery, the Nifty is seeing a bit of resistance at the higher levels. We are mentioning the 50 DMA would be a bit of a resistance there at 22,300 and that's exactly where the index has reversed from around 22,300 levels now significantly off the highs of the day. 150 points now uh, on the Nifty off the highs. 22,160. Pull up the bank Nifty as well and that is also seeing a bit of underperformance from the highs 48,000 proving to be a resistance there for the index it started off higher went close to 47,950 that is where it reversed from yesterday as well and now it has also seen some bit of correction from higher levels so bit of resistance there Maglam at higher levels for the market bit of resistance there for the higher levels uh, you know uh, Hormas we're looking at uncertainty still there in the market right so as a result of which Yes, we see some recovery from the lows, but triggers for upside seem limited until there is some clarity on the various factors that are playing out right now, not least of which is uh, the general elections which we're looking at in terms of an importance. And apart from that, just today, we will also get the US inflation data that will weigh on, on sentiments in the global markets as well. Wix once again has begun to rise, so it's up around 2% after breaking the 14-day uh, gaining streak in yesterday's trading session up back above that 20.5 mark. But a lot of individual stocks are in focus. And what will keep the bulls happy is that the advance decline ratio is still firmly in favor of advances for the second day running. One of them on our radar right now is Aadhaar Housing Finance has made its debut on the exchanges today. The stock listed largely flat at about 315 rupees per share. Rishi Anand, who's the managing director and CEO of the company, joins us now to discuss the company's post-listing plans. Thanks a lot, Rishi, for joining in. Uh, you know, what we've been speaking about in terms of growth or demand in consumption over the last couple of years has been very skewed towards the upper end. You cater to the lower end of the society with average ticket sizes being around that 10 to 11 lakh rupee mark. How is consumption there right now? Have you seen a pickup in the last uh, you know, couple of months or so? And would that mean you grow above and beyond that 15% CAGR that you've been doing over the last few years? Great. First of all, very good morning to both of you. Uh, too many questions in one question, but I'll try and attempt other questions. Uh, one is you spoke about uh, uh, the demand uh, on the lower income segment that we operate in. We typically operate in the EWS LIG segment. And if I were if I were to refer, so so the when you see when you call out the growth in the higher segment is higher, it is because simply because of the ticket size. Uh, if you look at one of the datas of RBI in 2019, which spoke about the housing unit shortfall in the country, pegged at about 10 crore housing unit shortfall. Out of the 10 crore, 9.5 crore housing shortfall comes in the EWS LIG segment where we operate. And if I were to translate that into the housing loan requirement, loan amount, it translates to about 35 trillion. So demand side, I don't see an issue. Yes, we have been growing at the range at about close to about 20% on, on, on AUM, 23, 24% on disbursement. ROEs are great. ROA is great. And, and the way the market demand is packed at, I don't see an issue at all when it comes to growth. Mr. Anand, good morning. Thanks a lot for joining in. Congratulations on becoming a public company today. But I wanted to ask you about the fact that you're focusing more on the non-home loans business as well, right? The share from that has increased to almost 24% from 15% for the first nine months of FY24. Do you see that share going higher going forward into FY25 as well or do you expect to maintain that at current levels? 
So if I were to compare nine months FY22, FY23, we were at 23% FY22, we are at 24% FY23. I don't see any reason why we should take it beyond at 25%. You know, internally the management feels that we are a housing finance company, 75-25% is the kind of number we should be maintaining. Above all, you know, there is a, there is a, you know, a housing finance companies are regulated with a, with a, with a set of 60% being mm. home loan retail which translate to about 75% home loan retail on balance sheet which translate, translate to about 75% home loan. So I think we are very comfortable maintaining 75-25 on home loan, non-home loan. All right, uh, that makes sense with a 20% AUM growth, 75-25 uh, mix. What's also interesting is that uh, the shift that you've seen from salary to non-salary. In fact, uh, self-employed as a percentage of your customers have increased from about 36% a couple of years ago, now all the way up to 43%. Just wanted to understand the economics of the same. Do they offer higher yields? And uh, is there a little more risk to self-employed versus salary? So what has happened with us is, you know, we've predominantly been uh, operating, the way we've expanded our, our geography, we were, we were always in larger cities and larger towns. In the last one and a half years, we've started moving into deeper locations, smaller locations, smaller talukas, smaller districts. The moment you start hitting these smaller locations, they are predominantly self-employed customers. That is one point why our, you know, self-employed segment has, has seen a little, a little jump. Salaried segment, uh, we've now hovering around 57-58%. Uh, Self-employed definitely gives us uh, a kicker on yield of about 350 basis points higher than what home loan, uh, f higher than what salaried customer gives in. And on the risk side, it gives me only a, 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 a high of about 40 to 50 bips on, on delinquencies. So yes, it, it, uh, from, a, from a pure business perspective, it makes sense to balance out both salaried and, and self-employed. But I think the enhancement of self-employed is happening because of the deeper impact, the deeper locations that we are getting into. Right. Uh, Mr. Anand, I wanted to stick to the non-home loans business because that has also contributed to your net interest margins as well. As of the December quarter, they stood at around 9%. Now that you're a public company, I can ask you some numbers. What's your guidance for your NIMS going into FY25 for the full year? Uh, see, we, we've uh, been a comfortable a company, comfortable at about eight and a half, nine percent uh, kind of NIMS, um, and uh, spreads become one of the important factors in in, in the contribution to NIM. We've hovering around five and a half to six percent on NIMS and uh, on spreads, and we are very very comfortable maintaining that. Yes, uh, self-employed and loan against property contribute significantly higher to your NIMS. And as I, as I guided, you know, 25% uh, will be our non-home loans. We would not want to extend beyond that. So that's the proportion we will be comfortable maintaining. All right. And final question then, with this uh, capacity, uh, uh, with, with, with the fundraising that you've done, your, you know, CRER increases, uh, how long does this fund your growth for before you have to tap the markets once again? So the way we look at it, another uh, three, uh, another any, anywhere between three to four years, I don't think we need to come back to the market. Uh, we have come uh, we've come to the market now. Three to four years from now, there is no requirement for coming back to the market. Well, promoter shareholding is around 76 and a half, Mr. Anand. Would you look to bring that down to 75 percent anytime soon? It's actually moved down to about 70, close to about 75.8. Uh, with a 22, 23 percent, 22 point uh, some percent uh, uh, shareholding dilution now from a 98.7. So I don't think we are going to be hitting the market very soon. All right, Mr. Anand, we leave it at that. Thanks a lot for joining in. Wish you good luck as a public company for FY25. We're looking to chat more often on this platform. That is the management there of Aadhaar Housing Finance, a subdued listing, just half a percent higher roundabout at the issue price of 315. But let's shift focus now to our special segment where we get you a few ideas for profit from Money Control Pro. Sachin Pal of moneycontrol.com joins in now to talk about a stock that he's tracking closely. Sachin, what do you have for us? Sarah Centriver posted a decent set of numbers in the final quarter of FY24. Revenues for Q4 were in fact up 3% year on year. However, the profits after tax grew almost 20% year on year thanks to us expansion in operating margins. Whereas the, the demand for the overall company has kind of slackened in the last couple of quarters and that has a really impact on the overall revenue growth for FY24. However, the company has in fact expanded its facility in the faucet where which, which puts in a good stead from a long term standpoint. Also, the company is looking forward to land acquisition for the sanitary facility post which it will start the project execution as well as expansion of the sanitary facility as well. Overall, the company enjoys a very strong foothold in the retail market and therefore 75% of the revenues in fact come from the retail segment which largely insulates from, from the demand supply shocks of the 
uh, real estate market. Therefore, the company is in a very strong position to be able to grow its scale in the coming years. Well, the stock has also seen a correction of almost 20-25% given the subdued set of numbers in the past couple of quarters and is currently trading at around 35 times the FI25 estimated earnings, which we believe is very reasonable for accumulation from a long-term standpoint. Right, that's about Sena, Sera Sanitary, where an idea for profit coming in from our colleagues at Money Control Pro. Take a short break. On the other side, we're not done with speaking to management. Sanjeev Astana, the CEO of Patanjali Foods, joins in to discuss their quarter gone by. Stay tuned. Welcome back. You're watching us here on Chartbusters. Let's uh, get chatting with the management of Patanjali Foods. Remember, the company reported a 4.5% growth in their revenues in the fourth quarter, with margins expanding by about 40 basis points as well. Food was the revenue driver for the company. Food and FMCG, that is, with a jump of almost 50% year on year. Sanjeev Astana, who's the CEO of the company, joins in to discuss uh, the business further. Thanks a lot, Mr. Astana, for joining in. Always a pleasure speaking with you. Um, you know, before we just talk about the business and the growth going forward, uh, there was an interesting footnote in your accounts which said that uh, the board has formed a committee to consider the proposal of acquisition of the non-food business of Patanjali Ayurved Limited. So I just wanted to know a couple of things. One, uh, by when are we likely to hear on any development that will take place out here? And what could the revenue potential of the business that you are onboarding here with margin potential be? Uh, so, on the revenue potential, I will uh, keep the remarks reserved right now, Mangla. But uh, on the announcement, uh, you will hear very soon. The diligence is going on. And uh, we're pretty hopeful that, uh, you know, you will see in a couple of weeks an announcement in terms of the, uh, you know, the acquisition part once the diligence is done. And uh, I would say that is going to be extremely bit decorative, uh, very positive, uh, you know, in terms of the uh, for the company's overall consolidation of the FMCG portfolio. Uh, but more importantly, we are hoping that the high margin products that it has and, uh, you know, some of the most solid brands uh, in its category, I think would come into the listed uh, entity, which should be beneficial, uh, you know, overall for the investor's perspective, as well as for company's uh, performance. So would this just be the personal care business or would this also include some of the Ayurvedic products, medical care business as well? Because what we know of Patanjali non-food, which is not part of your listed entity right now, there is Dant Kanti, there is of course uh, the soap business that you have, the shampoos business, the wash business. Is there anything else that would be added or what is it that so, would be added according to you? So all the all the categories, home care, personal care, dental care, skin care, and uh, there are some uh, very solid uh, sort of brands and products there which are extremely receptive, uh, you know, well received by the consumers. So the entire portfolio is uh, going to move, uh, you know, once uh, if we go through the diligence, once we go through the diligence and the acquisition happens. Is there a ballpark figure that you can share on the revenue potential, Mr. Astana? Uh, it would not be fair. I think uh, that's an unlisted entity that diligence is going on, but just wait for a couple of, but it's a large business. It's a very large business, uh, you know, from the numbers that we see currently uh, very profitable. Uh, and uh, so I think just uh, be patient for a couple of weeks. Uh, you will soon hear from us. Yeah, we'll definitely be patient for a couple of weeks. Uh, you know, the only thing that's piqued my curiosity, curiosity right now is because the last time you joined us, you said that uh, the revenues that you see for the company would be close to around a little over 35,000 crores and for the group would be about uh, closer to 50,000 crores. So the delta here is 15,000 crores. I wonder how much of that is uh, the non-food business. Is it... Uh, fair to say, is it 50-50? Uh, no, no, certainly not. I don't think uh, we'll have uh, that size and scale uh, which will accrue. Uh, mm. So broadly, the reflection of uh, you know the prices where we have on the commodity portfolio. Uh, so this year, for example, our revenues have been uh, in general uh, you know pretty flat uh, because even though the volumes went up uh, across the board and uh, in the in the business. But uh, because the price points were lower, especially on edible oil, where we saw a significant decline from the price point per ton, uh, which is why you're seeing lower values. But our margin profile, et cetera, will certainly uh, keep getting better. And uh, once the non-food part uh, sort of comes in, as in when that happens, you will see a significant addition both to the bottom line as well as to the top line. Okay, let me just try it one this way again. A food currently accounts for, food and FMCG currently accounts for 33% of your revenues, right? This is in your current mix of things. Once the non-food business comes in, 
then how much would food and FMCG account? Uh, so good. Uh, so I mean, uh, you know, you're forcing me to give a number right now. It's uh, it's available. Uh, it would be un uh, you know wrong on my part to be uh, sharing that number. So I think suffice it to say, from an FMCG perspective, that's a large number, and uh, you know, uh, and high margin business also. So you will see a sufficient accreditation. I think I would imagine that at least on the FMCG portfolio itself, we should add good between anywhere between uh, 35 to 50 percent uh, addition to the FMCG portfolio. We try, Mr. Astana, to get numbers out, but both, uh, but in your PNL, you mentioned that your finance costs had gone up significantly. What would you attribute that to, Mr. Astana? Because there has not been a proportionate increase in your debt, but the finance cost has gone up significantly. No, no, this was, uh, you know, just an accounting treatment to the redemption of preference shares. So we had almost uh, uh, nearly 92 crores of preference share redemption. That is the reason the finance cost is showing higher. And uh, so that's it. I mean, there's absolutely no other sort of charge and no debt uh, increase, etc. Uh, so that's purely an accounting sort of uh, entry, which is showing a higher uh, cost. Let's get the regulation questions out of the way then. Uh, uh, you know, what is the kind of revenue volume growth that you're targeting this year in all your uh, segments? And what are the kind of margins that you're, one should expect? Uh, so typically, I'll just, uh, you know, uh, run through those. So I think on the uh, FMCG that we've already has mentioned, that we want to maintain a growth rate of anywhere between 8 to 10 percent on the revenue side. Uh, the margin construct, we want to maintain between 16 to 18 percent. Uh, we are pretty much on course for that. Uh, you know, the foods portfolio has been very positive. The configuration of the food portfolio, which we were just doing on the investor call as well, uh, undergoes a, the mix uh, changes. So this year we had a high proportion of the staples portfolio uh, and uh, the, uh, you know, the premium portfolio also continued to grow. But broadly on the FMCG side, you should hear from us that uh, we are nearly 10,000 crores now. Uh, we, will, we are expecting that uh, we should see a 10% plus growth uh, in this year on the existing business, not the new business that will uh, come into our fold. And on the edible oil side, we had a mar uh, the growth in volumes of nearly 13%. But on the revenue side, we saw the price point decline by almost 25% because the edible oil prices came down. Uh, but uh, we expect that, uh, you know, the growth in edible oil will taper off closer to 6 to 8%, uh, you know, compared to the country's growth of 2 and 3%. Uh, so broadly, I think uh, compared to 31,000 odd crores of revenue this year, we should uh, see closer to about 35,000 crores next year, uh, not including uh, the uh, new business, uh, which will get added to the company in the fullness of time. Very quickly, Mr. Astana, due to positive time, but has there been any impact on the business uh, because of the issues that Patanjali Ayurved has faced when it comes to the Supreme Court? Uh, none at all. In fact, uh, if at all, uh, you know, we quarter four has been very positive for us when the you know most of this uh, sort of uh, issues were uh, getting discussed. So largely, uh, completely untouched, and uh, that also should be a thing of the past uh, very soon. Uh, so I think the uh, direction is positive and we are pretty uh, hopeful that all of it, uh, you know, will be passed behind us. And But on the business front, we see virtually no impact at all. Uh, that was an important question to ask largely because, you know, now some more brands from Patanjali Ayurved would be coming into your fold as well. But do you have any internal uh, measure of the metric of brand structure, brand strength right now, which may have taken a dent, if at all? Uh, so, so just to clarify, you know, the in terms of the brands, uh, you know, that perhaps uh, are being alluded to, are uh, typically these are all Ayurvedic medicines, which are not, uh, you know, at all either in the mix of, uh, you know, the businesses that we're evaluating, uh, nor it has had any impact. So pretty much on the non-food, uh, those are, you know, the Ayurvedic medicines uh, that are under discussion. And uh, so uh, almost uh, no impact on either the sales or the, uh, you know, the imagery or the consumer response. Uh, nothing, uh, not one bit on our business. All right. Thanks a lot for joining in and giving us that uh, update. Uh, you know, one would have thought that even though the businesses are different, the brand name together may have had some uh, overlaps here and there. But uh, take your point out there and we will be awaiting. Uh, hope to speak to you as soon as you, you know, bring the other businesses into your fold in a couple of weeks, as the management is saying, Hormaz. Indeed. And the stock reaction as well, half a percent higher of the lows of the day, but of the highs of the day as well. So not much when it comes to an earnings reaction from Patanjali Foods. But time for a short break. Back with more on the markets and specific stocks on the other side. Stay tuned.
Back with us here on Chartbusters. The market has seen a bit of a recovery from when we started the show off. The Nifty is back at 22,200, but the broader markets continue to do well. The mid cap index is up almost seven tenths of a percent, so as is the small cap index. But the PSU banks are the outperformers in today's session, while the Nifty Bank continues to see a bit of a struggle. But with that, it's a wrap on this edition of Chartbusters from Mangalam, me and the team that put this show together. Thank you so much for watching. Trading R is up next. <laughs>